thank you for joining us and welcome to a virtual fireside chat with two incredible people that I've known for uh, many years doing incredible things in the healthcare space. So first I'd like to welcome to this virtual chat, Dr. Colleen Cutcliffe, CEO of Pendulum Therapeutics, a San Francisco based probiotic company that is creating products that treat some of the ailments we have in a natural manner. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Mike Moreno, who is the author of the 17 day diet, as well as the 17 day kickstart diet, which is new and out on Amazon and is a new book that he's just published. He's also been the host of the Wellness Inc. podcast, uh, going into different ways you can biohack, as well as a frequent guest on the doctors and the Dr. Phil show. So thanks a lot for joining today, guys. I look forward to our conversation, the candid discussion about gut health and just the food we put into our gut and how it makes us healthy. Excited to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great to be here. I'm really excited to get into this. Both of you guys have accomplished a lot. And I think just to set the context of what the conversation is going to be about, we have an epidemic, a pandemic in this country of metabolic syndrome and obesity drives it, what people are eating drives it. But also we find out that some of this, these medical problems lead to problems in the gut. And sometimes the gut can also be, the gut health can also be where some of these disease syndromes sort of take place. And so both of you are accomplished in both your fields, Mike addressing some of the inputs to the gut, which is food and stress and sleep and how that affects uh, your overall microbiome and your general health. And Colleen is coming in from a microbiome perspective where your gut health is critical to processing the food that goes into it so that we are healthy and our body is processing the, the inputs to a degree that we can be healthy. But we also learned in disease states that these, this microbiome can be unhealthy and, and not properly use the fuel, fuels that we're actually putting into it. So I'm an emergency room physician by trade, and I'm going to moderate this conversation between Mike and Colleen. Let's start out by uh, saying and disclosing that both of the, uh, Colleen and Mike have each other's products. So Colleen, uh, you do have a copy of Mike's book. And uh, Mike is got PGC in hand in his refrigerator as we speak. There it is in its glory. I removed it out of the refrigerator just shortly, just for this, but it goes yes. right back in. <laughs> and we'll revisit uh, in eight weeks how you two have done following, you know, the kickstart diet, Colleen, and then Mike, what it's like to be on PGC and see the changes that occur in your guys' lives over the next couple of weeks. So first off, I want to start out by asking Colleen, what, what is the microbiome and, and how does it differ in the gut microbiome and why should, why should we even care about it? Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah. Um, well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a, a friend, a buddy who could just eat whatever they wanted and drink whatever they wanted, and yet they seem to be skinny all the time? Yeah. You hate those people. Yeah. You hate those people. <laughs> we all know people like that. And one of the questions is why, why do people have uh, the ability to eat whatever they want to and drink whatever they want to, and other people have to really watch every single thing they're putting into their body. And one of the answers that's kind of emerged over the last decade is your gut microbiome. So there are all these bacteria and viruses and fungi that reside in your gut, and they are things that we've co-evolved with, and they actually help you metabolize your food. We've normally thought about your microbiome or probiotics as helping you with GI distress, but they're doing a lot more than just handling your GI. They're also metabolizing everything that you're eating. And so one of the things that's become clear is that it's not just about the fuel that you put into your body. It's about the engine in that car. And the engine is really your gut microbiome. And, and that's why it matters. And that's why it's important. And so you might find that there are particular functions that these people who have great metabolisms, you know, have a ton of in their microbiome and people who have slower metabolisms metabolisms are, are missing them. And, and really the unlock or the key to this, you know, nebulous concept of metabolism is you just need more of these microbes that are metabolizing your fibers, helping you metabolize sugars better. And that's really been an, a fascinating science that we've been interested in and helping people to have all of the different tools in their toolbox to help them live healthy lives. Yeah, no, I think, I think you make a great point is it comes down to what are these microbiome with these bacteria doing with the inputs and how does that affect people? And it's so powerful because there's so many of them, right? What are the numbers? The numbers are, are million billions, right? And how many cells do we have that are actually truly human cells compared to bacteria cells? So having this flora that's actually in a healthy state is critical because if it's imbalanced, 
you're, you're going to have problems, right? And can you maybe go over why if you're in a disease state and you have metabolic syndrome, maybe pre-diabetes or type two diabetes, you've sort of gotten to this point where there's some dysfunction in your metabolic syndrome. How does, how does your gut look if you have reached this point? You know, of course it's different from person to person, but some of the trending that we see is that as people kind of march down the, the, the path of metabolic syndrome, you start to see this correlation where they're losing certain microbes that are doing, performing these functions. And I mean, Mike is, is definitely going to talk to this, but a lot of the ways that you can start to get those functions back is through the foods that you're eating and trying to feed the right microbes. But what you see is a depletion of some of these important microbes. And so I think it's, it's important to know that you know, your diet and, and exercise and things like that are things that impact your gut microbiome. But there's also a lot of stuff that's outside of your control that can cause you to become depleted in these things. So aging, stress, traveling to a different time zone where day becomes night and night becomes day uh, for women going through menopause, all of these life changes and things that we kind of all go through uh, as a part of life are depleting our microbiome along the way. And so really trying to understand how do you get that, that right microbiome back is, is really is, is a big unlock. What, what do we see in people with gut dysfunction? What's, you know, how are, we, how are they going to feel? What, what are we going to see on the outside? What are they going to feel on the inside? Well, when you have sort of missing components of your gut microbiome, it can show up in a, in a few different ways. You know, one of the most obvious is, you know, you have a hard time digesting foods. You feel sick, you feel bloated, cramping, diarrhea, constipation, all of that. But what we're learning is that it can affect your metabolism, your ability to metabolize sugars. So you start to see higher A1Cs, um, elevated sugar spikes after you eat foods that have glucose in them. Um, a lot of people experience things that are a little bit, you know, less quantitative in terms of blood tests. So, you know, things like brain fog or feeling less energy, having a hard time sleeping, all of these things are linked to how your body metabolizes glucose. And I think what we're starting to learn is that your ability to metabolize sugars is actually at the heart of being able to age in a healthy way, age in a way where you have the energy and the acumen that we all you know, want to hold on to from our youth. And so it's super important to think about the body as you know, not just your genes and everything that you're doing, but also these microbes that are inside of you and making sure that you have the right ones in there so that you can have both the you know, right blood work tests from an inflammatory and, and sugar level, but also the right lifestyle in terms of being able to sleep well and, and be sharp and on your toes all day long. Yeah. So you see, you see these effects and sort of the problem of, of having this imbalance in your gut and what the actual outcome is. And then the work that you're doing is focused on how do you restore the system back to health and maybe talk about how how your work is working on this, this problem where you recognize that something's not right, something's out of whack, and we gotta, we gotta make it better. Things like probiotics and yogurts have been on the shelves for a very long time, for decades. And they're comprised of more or less the same ingredients that have been around for you know over 50 years. And so how do you go after this in a new way? How do you not just use the same old probiotics that are on the shelves and really think about what are these dys dysbioses that are not being solved by the things that are already out there? And how do you apply the right scientific method to this? And it really boils down to you know DNA sequencing and being able to sequence the microbiome and then look at it like it's a, a systems biology problem. So think of it like a trampoline. If somebody's jumping on one part of the trampoline, how does that impact the person who's on another part of the trampoline? Your whole system in your, in your body is connected to each other in that way where you change one thing over here and it really impacts you over here. And so we're trying to understand through DNA sequencing of the microbiome, what changes can you make to the microbiome and what impact does that have to your microbiome? But then more importantly, what impact does that have to yourself? And so so it starts with knowing if you have diabetes or prediabetes, what are you depleted in? What are those things maybe doing that you need? And if we give them back to you, does that actually give you back your ability to perform metabolism of food properly? And when you approach it that way in a very systematic way, what we've been able to do in almost a decade of work is figure out what are these key microbes to, that you can give back to people and help them really jumpstart the metabolism. And it's so cool because Mike, you probably experienced this too, which is that when people start getting healthy in one part of their life, they start actually experiencing in other parts. And I don't know if you have stories 
issues about, you know, where you're going after one part, one system in the body, and then all of a sudden people come back and they, they feel totally different. But, you know, this thing about helping people metabolize their sugars and having them come back with better energy. We have somebody who said their, their ping pong game is even better. You know, there's just all these other things that you don't even know are, are, you know, related. I don't know, Mike, you probably have stories like that. You know, there's just, I, I just couldn't wait to chime in because I have to just say, <laughs> First of all, Colleen, thank you for the efforts, the research, your team and everything you've done, because this is one of those things in the more than two decades that I've been practicing and working with patients. This is one of those things that you almost thought you'd never get. You would almost thought you would never be able to purchase or attain something that is this much of a game changer. And you know, I've always said to my patients, I've said this for years, it's very simple. You can have the best materials, the best engineers and the best everything and have the most amazing vision for building a skyscraper, the greatest in the world. But if you don't have a foundation, if you don't have a clear base and foundation to build that skyscraper, it's never gonna work. And what you've done and what your team has done has created that foundation. You've created something that for so many years we, we've just never known you know i've been telling my patients for years eat the right foods exercise and don't get me wrong of course that's great but you said this at the beginning why does it work for some people and not for others and what the, the work you guys have done has unlocked that and whether you're improving someone's ping pong game or improving their life or the lives of their families and loved ones this is a fantastic amazing thing and I, this is just the beginning and i I'm just looking forward to seeing what this can do. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think those are great points, Mike. And actually, this leads us right into you know you've you've written a book on diet, Colleen. Also, Pendulum has a component of nutrition as a sort of an attribute. You get a nutritionist to kind of talk to you about the diet you should bring in as you use some of these products. And we have we've always known that the westernized diet has got some issues. And Mike, you are the expert, um, you know, as far as how we should be fueling ourselves and what choices we should make and how in a short amount of time, those 17 days, something can happen. So I just wanted to first add, you know, thanks for your work on the diet stuff. Cause it's changed my life. I've actually been a huge fan of the book. It's like a Bible to me. And, you know, even here I'm drinking one of your, <laughs> uh, you know, water recipes. And so, yeah, both of you guys, I, I throw this out there is, you know, what's the negative impacts of your diet on your body and your, your metabolic system, as well as on the gut microbiome? Like, so kind of, I toss it out to both, both of you guys. Wait, but before, I'm going to, I'm going to let Mike take that, but I just want to say that I, I have the book. I just got it. This is my brand new copy. I'm <laughs> super excited to kick in because right now I see like Paul's drinking this healthy, something that's definitely been recommended in your book. And I I'm drinking, you know, coffee, which is probably <laughs> you know, not, not one of the most recommended things, but it is, it's exciting to think about how, you know, small changes can lead to really big things that, that, that help you their health. So I'm, I'm excited to hear you talk about it. Yeah. You know, first of all, my philosophy in, in, as it applies to our health and how we live it, whether it's what we do, how we eat, how we manage our stress, how we sleep, there are so many aspects of health. We can't just relate health to weight. We, we know that that's not true. We all know people who are seemingly fit and thin, but they're not ideal health. And so I think, you know, and to your point, Colleen, as you speak about the caffeine, my programs have always been about, you know, moderation of everything, more of the good and less of the bad. I drink my coffee in the morning. I have an occasional glass of wine. I do all of these things, but I do them in moderation and I do them with a sense of knowing that I'm taking care of things like my microbiome, like my gut. You know, there is, a, a lot of research, a lot of buzz around something called the GBA, the gut brain axis, essentially this two way highway where your gut communicates with your central nervous system and your central nervous system back. And when I think about it, you think about things like when people are stressed and they feel nauseous, they feel that stomach turn, they feel uncomfortable. This is a real thing. This is not some manifestation and some made up thing. And when people eat or feed themselves, or as I like to say, fuel themselves in a less than ideal way, it manifests itself the same way. It affects depression, it affects stress, anxiety, our emotions, our ability to sleep. It, the list goes on and on. So I think this two-way highway 
And I think the research that's been done is amazing and it's going to continue to expand. But the bottom line is, again, when you look at the gut, when you look at food, when you look at the digestion process, what starts as soon as you put something in your mouth, things go to work, magical things. And these things are the things that dictate how you function, how you sleep, your muscles, your ligaments, your tendons, your heart, lungs, liver, the list is on and on. And most of all, how you feel, you know, people have every good intention and think they're doing everything right. But if you're not in the right state of mind, if you're not confident, if you're not feeding your mind properly, and you do this through feeding your gut properly or providing that that proper sort of microbiome that we're talking about. But if you don't have that, if you don't have that state of mind that you need, getting healthy can be a challenge. So establishing that is critical. And that's the work that you're doing, which is absolutely just amazing. I think it's so important to think about that whole comprehensive picture too. You know, it, it is, it, it's interesting because I mean, all of us have felt at some point you, you're, something is stressing you out or you feel really sad about something. And first place I go is my refrigerator. You know, like you just get a craving or, or to my pantry, I'm looking for the chips. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's, it's natural. We all kind of, it's interesting when you talk about the two-way highway between the gut and the brain, because you're, you get these certain food cravings and you don't really know where they're coming from, but it really is this relationship between your gut and your brain that we don't fully understand. And one of the amazing things that I learned about people taking, you know, pendulum glucose control was that we had all our customers coming back saying, I have less sugar cravings. We never even suspected that we never, you know, measured it in our clinical trials. We never even thought to ask anybody about it. They were volunteering this information up. And it just goes to show us that we're just at the beginnings of unlocking how changing your gut can change the way you feel, which can change the way that you view food, which can change the way that you eat, which can change the way you exercise, all of it's related. And so if you can, maybe sometimes we can end up in a really bad cycle where we're not eating well, then we feel lethargic and then we're not eating well and feeling. So how do you break out of that? It could be one little thing that pulls you out of it and gets you onto a whole new great cycle. You bring up a great point um, when you talked about that idea of when people are stressed. Some people are stress eaters. You know, when you look at the impact of stress eating in in the world, in our country, as far as you want to reach and look, that's a major thing and, and it can go to so many different areas. But when you can find something to control the gut biome and you can find something that will affect this GBA that we're talking about, this gut brain axis, that's a huge part of the puzzle. So you make a great point and it's, you know, again, when we're stressed, sometimes we don't eat. Sometimes we have, you know, when we're excited, we have butterflies in our stomach. Sometimes when we're stressed, we reach for food. It's that connection, it's the neurotransmitters, the chemicals, the things, the messages going on from your brain to your gut saying, here's how you're gonna respond. We're all different, but for the most part, when that signal is not the best signal that that you would think of, bad things happen. And when you start doing bad things in the gut and how you feel your body and how you eat, it just manifests itself in so many areas of the body and so many organ systems. You see diabetes, you see fatty liver, there's an epidemic of pre-diabetes now. I, I don't even think the numbers out there reflect the true actual disease entity that's there. Y- you know, I think there could be as many as half of the population, and I really truly believe this, that are pre-diabetic. And so this is a game changer. And I think when you look at Pendulum and you look at the impacts of all the things it does, when you look at the impact that this can do in taking someone who's pre-diabetic and making them or putting them in a normal level of sugar glucose control, that is as big a game changer as anything out there. And there's nothing else out there that does this. And I think it's critical, Mike, when you talk about this, because the downstream effects of diabetes and prediabetes is sort of that stepping stone to get to, to diabetes. The downstream problems I see in the ER all the time, you know, we're talking about strokes and heart attacks and infections and all the stuff that comes along with it, and and then the cost in the medical system, the importance of tackling this one problem, this, this, you know, pre-diabetes metabolic syndrome, and and the problems that occur in the gut, once you start going down this pathway, it's super critical to almost the United States, because that's where we see this problem the biggest. I mean, it's, it's huge in the United States. Absolutely. And, and, you know, the new player, the bigger, the big player that's, you know, right on the heels of prediabetes and diabetes is fatty liver. Yet another thing that we know, what are the ways to reverse 
not just control, reverse fatty liver disease, exercise, you know, stress management, of course, hydration, and how we fuel our bodies, how we get our bodies energy, the proper energy. More importantly, when you can show weight loss, sustainable weight loss, 5% slows down that scarring and inflammation, a 10% sustainable weight loss reverses something as bad as, as fatty liver. You know, I remember 25 years ago when we would see these ultrasounds and they'd say, well, everything looks okay. We don't see any, any tumors, any masses, any significant things. It's a little bit of fatty liver, otherwise it looks okay. Well, 25 years ago, a little bit of fatty liver, we didn't realize can result in cirrhosis, scarring and cirrhosis. We've traditionally thought of cirrhosis as being related to alcohol or other liver diseases, hepatitis, things of this nature. But here comes along fatty liver, sneaks into our lives and now is causing cirrhosis. And when you develop cirrhosis, things don't get better. And you know this, you've seen these guys, Paul in the ER, it is not a pretty picture. So when we can stop this in its tracks, and again, fatty liver is yet another thing, but when we can make some impacts, reverse this disease, it, it, it's a game changer, an absolute game changer. You know, it, it's amazing to think about, um, you know, the the numbers are astonishing how many people are are dealing with these issues and, the, and just the growth of that. Um, and I think one thing that I was found most surprising or shocking was that it's creeping its way into a younger and younger population. You know, these used to be diseases of aging, and now you have teenagers, you know, with type 2 diabetes. And so I'm curious, you know, you guys see a ton of this. Are you seeing that creep into the younger population? And, you know, how do we help prevent people from having, you know, now 70 years of living with something? I, I mean, sadly, you are absolutely right. And uh, we've seen this evolved over the decades. And just in my short, I like to think of, you know, 25 years as short term uh, in practice, but you've seen this evolution, something that you almost didn't predict. And, you know, everyone used to call it, right, adult onset diabetes. Well, when you see a 12 year old, I don't consider 12 year olds typically an adult. So it's not really adult onset diabetes anymore. And I think that's where the evolution of the name has, has changed. But take a deeper, deeper dive and take a look at what you just brought up. And it's absolutely true. And yet this is preventable. This is reversible when you look at it from the pre-diabetes standpoint. This is a preventable disease. And, you know, I still have faith in, in human spirit and, and our abilities. And I think if we cohesively come together we support each other we look for things and we we are fortunate to have to have people like you and your company and and the people that you've that have, you've worked with to develop something like this there's a lot of hope and i think between the kind of work that you do and the kind of stuff that i do right introducing lifestyle change doable likable affordable sustainable lifestyle change we can get a hold of these these diseases and really take control of people's lives. I think one of the most amazing things is that when you do change your diet, you see results almost immediately. And, and this kind of goes to why you might have chose 17 days, Mike. Why, why do you start seeing things right away? And how is food that powerful? And, and then we can get to how is medical food that powerful? And, and sort of why PGC is so powerful and what it does. And, and we're ingesting things and the choices we make and what we ingest truly makes a difference almost immediately. You can start seeing the changes right away. Yeah, you know, simply put, and you said it, it doesn't take forever. And, you know, we live in a society now where we want to see change yesterday, right? When we order something on Amazon, if it doesn't show up in the morning, there was some delay or something going on. This is the world we live in. It's not going to change. It may even get worse or better, however you view this, you know, this whole idea. But the <laughs> bottom line is you need to show people that, listen, it doesn't take two or three months to see change. It takes a few days and you know the whole idea of detoxing or scrubbing or you know you know cleansing your body it shouldn't have to take months and just simple things like hydration establishing a good gut biome whether that's through supplements through the foods you eat all of these things the, you can see these changes in two or three days yeah are you going to drop 20 pounds in two or three days of course not but it's about building that skyscraper, right? It's about creating change, sustainable change. And I, I think that you need to show, and this went back to my book in 2010. If you can show people quick results that are done in a healthy way, they're in. 
Now they're yeah. interested. And I think to your point, that's exactly it. There are ways to do this. It's not about starving yourself. It's not about giving up everything. It's about cleansing, getting rid of the junk food and replacing that with good, healthy food that's still delicious, still nutritious, and now building this foundation for long-term success. Yeah. And then as you feed your body with better things, you're going to want something to be transforming this great new you know, addition of fiber and butyrate producing foods into healthy byproducts. You know, so you need the gut in sort of how, how the synergy between your work and Colleen's work is that you're starting to feed your body with better things. The probiotics, the bacteria, the microbiome needs these prebiotics, which is inulin or different types of, you know, structures, fiber that can actually be the food that produces um, all the biochemical reactions that you see downstream that's healthy. And maybe Khan, you can go into sort of this, this word that's been tossed around. It's, it's the, the good guys, it's the, the currency of the gut and sort of Mike's talking about what you put into your body and, and the results you see now, maybe if you can sort of add how your microbiome is looking at all these great new things that are coming down the pipe. Literally. Yeah. I mean, we, we all know a high fiber diet is really good for us, right? We're supposed to be eating lots of fruits and vegetables, but what a lot of people don't know is that when you eat those high fiber foods, your body actually is not able to metabolize many of them. And it's actually your gut microbes that are doing that metabolism. And so what are they doing? They're metabolizing those fibers into a thing called butyrate. And butyrate is this, what's now being called a postbiotic. So you have your, your, your probiotics, which are your players, those are the, the, the actual microbes. The prebiotics are the food for them. And the postbiotics are the things that they make. And so, you know, butyrate is a really, really important molecule. It is in your colon, actually the primary source of energy for your colon cells. And so we know that when people get things like colorectal cancer, you know, their butyrate production is off. We know that butyrate also, it binds to these particular receptors and helps your body know it's time to release insulin and helps you with glucose and insulin control. And so when you don't have the right amounts of butyrate, you're actually not getting the right amount of glucose control. And so really your ability to, these fibers are doing so many different, you know, myriad of things for your body. And it's really about it, what we figured out in the microbiome is it's really about how you metabolize these fibers into butyrate. And that's why one person could be having the exact same high fiber diet as another person. And yet they are reaping all of these benefits. They have all these health benefits, lower inflammation, you know, lower metabolic syndrome, because they have the microbes that are metabolizing that fiber. And if you don't have those microbes, that great fiber that you're eating is literally going right through you. And that's why it's so important to have both the fi the high fiber diet, which are the prebiotics that feed then the probiotics to also have the probiotics in there so that you can actually get the result that you want. And so that's, I think the important thing that we, we started to learn is the importance of having those right strains that help you metabolize all that great fiber that you're introducing into your diet. So when you have a guy like Mike writing books about diet and including a, a chapter on probiotics and how butyrate is this important product. It just make, it must make your heart sing, knowing that there's this, this great um, you know, system out there where people are looking out for the macro, for the, the food, for the body, for the stress, and you're taking care of the micro from the, the microbiome and how, how the two are linked with each other. And in that you're, you're not just, just in this to, uh, by yourself, that there's a whole team of people working on this problem. Absolutely. And I would say, you know, one of the things that I really appreciate about Mike is his approach to health, um, not just from your sort of traditional writing prescription drugs, but really understanding what's at the heart of how people behave and how do you, you know, this idea of jump starting and showing somebody in a very quick amount of time a result that gives them a foundation from which they can build better and better lifestyle choices, but then also little tools that are easy to implement in your life that become part of your lifestyle. And you don't feel like every day that you make a bad choice you really just, you know, ruined everything, but you have these little tools that are helping you have the confidence and the right frame of mind to keep making good choices and to bounce back from bad ones. And I think, you know, we do, especially in the United States, live in a world where a lot of physicians are about prescribing drugs. That is, right. you know, their solution to things. And so it's super refreshing to have somebody, you know, like Mike here, who's thinking about all the components of health in a holistic way and doesn't have this preconceived bias that, you know, he knows only prescription drugs are the way to help you because all of us as, you know, patients, you know, of his know that 
that's not true. We know that there's other things we can be doing to be being healthy and, it, and it's not just about prescription drugs. And so I love it. I think if we could have more people thinking like Mike and really teaching people how to live healthier lives, we would see a real movement happening. And, and we're starting to see that too. Mike, what, what inspired you to write about the 17 day diet and, and sort of to talk about just this holistic health? Long story short, about 14 years ago, seeing a patient like I did every day in and out of rooms. And I saw a patient who had been seen for several years whose blood glucose and what we use to call A1C, which kind of gives you a control level. Uh, her sugar had gone on average up 100 points in a matter of three or four months. And it turned out the only thing she had changed in her life was that she stopped exercising. That was it. She was still eating about the same. She was, uh, you know, hydrating. She was, she was on her medications, but she stopped exercising. So I offered to start exercising with her and that's how it all started. And I thought to myself, to Colleen's point, the, the solution is not increase your medications. The solution is what is the variable here that was changed? Well, the variable wasn't that she quit her medicines. The variable wasn't in her dietary changes. It was the lack of exercise. So I started exercising with her and I figured if one person could use this, everybody could use this, myself included. So, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I said, give me a couple of weeks. I organized this thing. And what started is, is her and I walk. I, I said, meet me in my office at 630 in the morning. We're going to walk. We're going to replace that variable in your life and we're going to control your blood sugar in the process. What started is her and I and one of my nurses who I dragged along turned into an army of people, 10, 20, 30, 50, 60, 70, 80 people, dogs, three generations. And I remember one day as I sort of kind of lumbered behind everybody, right? I remember looking and seeing all of these people forgetting about the stress of life, forgetting about the bad things that happen to all of us that we don't have control over and going for a casual stroll around the block. And I realized that it's lifestyle change, not pharmaceuticals, not some of these other invasive techniques that we've chosen, unfortunately, to manage our health, but lifestyle change. Things like what Colleen is doing with Pendulum, creating healthy ways of fueling our bodies and maximizing what we get from how we fuel our bodies. It, you can't stress it enough. And Colleen brought this up at the beginning. You know, when two people are doing the identical thing, you know, it could be two, a man or a woman or both of them, same age, same everything, and you're getting different results. There's a reason. And I think the reason is going down to what we're talking about here, which is this gut biome to be able to kind of peel back the layers and understand this offers more support and, and just more energy and synergism towards lifestyle change. So I say we get back to the basics. You know, one of my favorite movies in of all, of all time is the Shawshank Redemption. And there's a point in that movie where the gentleman comes out of jail and he says, as he's narrating his walk out into public after being in prison for decades, he says, this world went and got itself in a big hurry. And that's what's happened. The world has got itself Great in a big line. hurry. It's absolutely amazing. And I've given a lot of talks and it's one of my slides that I start with. All we gotta do is just slow down, take a deep breath, respect our stress, look at how we're fueling our body and figure out ways to maximize how we're doing it. Using Pendulum, using all of these tools that we have, all of these very talented people that have contributed and we can get back to the healthy people that we once used to be. I'm very, very confident of that. Oh yeah, that's, that's amazing. I agree. It is, it is amazing when you look at the numbers. We had what, 10 times less diabetes in the 40s and 50s. I gotta look at the exact numbers, but the, 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 the amount of diabetes is, is astronomical now. Maybe because we are in a hurry. We're choosing bad things. We wanna just get our food in us. We wanna move to the next thing. And the pace of life has just gone so quickly. So it's a very poignant line that you pull from your favorite movie there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't stress it enough. And, and I've probably seen the movie about 500 times. And uh, every time I, I, I hear that line, I just go to the work that, that uh, I do and that so many people, talented people that I work around every day do. We're going to get there. I, I really think we're going to get there. And uh, we just got to figure out these these little tricks of the trade. And uh, we're going to make some some uh, headway through this. 
Yeah, and congratulations on your follow-up book, the 17 day kickstart diet and why why a follow-up book to this book that you were inspired to write 10 years ago and why now yeah you know for me it was a timely thing um and it was some unfortunate events that took place in my life going through a divorce leaving my home uh, the death of my mom the death of my sister all oh, wow. within about uh 18 months and i was like huh life's hard and, and I realized that was just my life and that was my story and that was what I'd lived. Multiply this by millions. Everybody has a story and everybody has a reason why they struggle. We both are all, we all know right from wrong. We all know that going through a red light at hundred miles an hour is probably a bad idea. We all know that when the light turns green, we look both ways and we go through the intersection. But why do we sometimes make bad decisions? I don't think we do it intentionally. I think we're distracted. We're distracted by our lives. We're distracted by unfortunate events that come our way, whether we like it or not. And so for me, it was like an opportunity to say, in the introduction of my book, I spend the first few pages saying, here's what happened to me. Not to get pity or not for people to say, oh, I feel bad for this guy, but for people to close that book and say, what happened to me? Why do I make bad decisions? Why do I struggle with exercise? Why do I struggle with smoking or bad behaviors? Why do I struggle with my weight? Why don't I sleep well? Why don't I make good decisions despite the fact that I know that I can? Well, you know, those are deep seated for a lot of people. It goes back to the work that a, a very famous guy that was actually the part of the Kaiser Group, Dr. Vince Folletti, published a study, the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Effects Study, and it looks at what's happened and so many people suffer trauma and that trauma as it as it sort of you know festers and grows in our body i truly believe that it manifests in bad behavior as we get older so my idea was let's give people the opportunity to reflect to look for help to look for support systems to really kind of dig down deep and say Maybe this isn't my fault and maybe there are changes I can make, but start foundationally, right? Start with some of the things that may have led you down this path, address them, acknowledge them, get the support systems. You, listen, I've been seeing the same therapist for 21 years and her and I, you know, we don't always see eye to eye, but she still finds me back in her office. Life's hard and I think we need each other and we need kind of a lot of things out there to support trying to get back on track. So look at your sleep, look at your stress management, look at how your life, whether as a child or even more recent, for me, all of this stuff happened in, in, in 18 months, but give yourself a break and be nicer to yourself, be more kind to yourself and recognize that there are some things that happen, maybe that they're all different for all of us, but if we move on and we have some really good tools in our tool shed, sky's the limit on what we can do for our health. I think what you said about, you know, cutting yourself some slack is super important. And I think one of the things that, you know, we focus on too, because we, we have nutrition coaching as, as part of our program is just because you do bad things, that doesn't make you a bad person. Just right. because you do bad things, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. And we all do bad things. Nobody's perfect. And so the question is, how do you forgive yourself or how do you surround yourself with the tools and the people that are going to help you keep moving in the right direction? And, you know, we have, we are nutrition coaches and probably it sounds like for, for you too, they end up being very close to some of, some of the customers that we have to the point where I remember, you know, one of our nutrition coaches got a text at 2 a.m. I just ate a, you know, two pieces of brownie and, you know, the, the coach, her job was to respond with, that's okay, go to bed, wake up in the morning, it's gonna be a fresh new day. And I think that kind of forgiveness that somebody else can give to you, but that you can also give to yourself is such an important part to changing our lives, to getting out of the rut that we're in, to knowing that there can be a brighter future. And that's such an important, to believe that that can happen, to believe that you can be that person is such an important part of this. And we're just here to give, you know, the, the microbiome, the food suggestions, the hydration suggestions, the coaching suggestions, but you have to believe that you can actually have that better life and, and you are a good person. Yeah, it really is that cycle. And again, it's just, you have to commend the work that you guys have done. The fact that you go that extra step, right? It's not just take this, it's take this and do some of these other things. And I will tell you the nutritional coaching 
is a critical and very unique piece. You're not going to find that. You're just not going to find that. And I think that is credit to the the comprehensive approach that you're taking. And it, it's it's critical. But uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, when I come across things like Pendulum and I come across the, the work you're doing, it, it gives me a little bit more confidence that that it makes me want to do more of what I do, right? It makes me want to just kind of say, hey, here's another tool. You know, here are some of the things that I've always, you know, try to come up with. And listen, who am I? I just come up with these things. I credit my mother. My mother put all these like weird little sayings and thoughts in my head, and I didn't know what they meant until I was probably about 40 years old. Now, fast forward, I'm 53, and I'm like, oh, yeah, now I understand. So, you know, find these little nuggets, these nurturing nuggets in life and, and utilize them and, and find things like the work you're doing, Colleen, and utilize them. But, you know, we need help. And I think uh, when you make this a collaborative effort and, and you really approach this from a comprehensive way, uh, we're going to get there. We really will get there. We are. I'm also super optimistic, although I'm not very happy about the fact that now I realize my kids are going to be 53 before they appreciate me. But <laughs> I, I was a slow uh, learner. What can I say? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You guys both use words like nutritional coaching and some sort of support system. And we know, Mike, I've, I've seen it on the Dr. Phil show. You talk about these three pillars and stress, sleep and support. And so you know, what you both are, have realized is you can't just throw something out into the world and expect it to survive. You can't just throw PGC out there and say, okay, good, good luck. Or you can't put a book out there and not kind of surround it with a 17 day challenge or with some, someone to help you through this stuff. So maybe you guys can talk about support and why that's important. How does that get you through when you're about to quit, when you're deciding, all right, I'm done with this. And we all have that threshold and people have, everyone has a different one, but support's critical. It's what gets you through a lot of this. I'm sure even if you're an Olympic athlete, you got tons of support coaches and things like that. Absolutely. You know, I, um, in, in this, the most recent project I did, I put a, a, a uh, chapter in there on, it's called building your bench. And I'm a big sports fan. I probably watch sports seven days a week. I don't care what's on if it's a sport I I'm in. And what I've always realized, and anybody will tell you as a sports fan, that the game is won with a solid bench. The game is won with that support system, the surrounding cast. And so building your bench is critical. And everybody's going to serve a role. And oftentimes you don't even know that role they're going to serve until you really need them. And so I think building that bench, having that solid foundation, so knowing when your star player is out, you injure yourself and can't exercise, who do you rely on? Who do you go to on your bench? You go to diet, you go to nutrition, you go to pendulum. Who do you call when you need help? So we can't plan all of these things and these barriers that occur. But for me, it was just, there has been some key people in my life and they're not maybe even the best of friends, but man, they're there when you need them. They're gonna win that, that game with a, a field goal or an extra point, whatever it may be. It's just that that support system is critical, building it, knowing who you can rely on and knowing, you know, when to call them. And uh, it's for me been a, a life changer. And I mean that personally and, I, and also with my patients, but I, I think for me, that's just a big, big part of it. It's so huge. I mean, there was a, a, a big, huge study that was done at Harvard over multiple generations of people. And they asked a simple question, what's the key to happiness? And they were looking at people from, you know, birth to death to generation over generation. And they were basically monitoring everything in their lives, how much money they made, how much power they had, how many people knew them, Facebook likes, all these different things. And they found at the end of this, you know, multi-decade study that it all boiled down to actually one thing. The key to happiness is relationships. And the people who had the strongest relationships, regardless of their wealth, their fame, their power, where they lived, big city, small town, those relationships, people who had strong relationships were the ones who were the most happy. And that's such an important thing for us to remember because we can throw so many tools at people, but it's the relationships that allow you to be able to use those tools in a way that really help you. And so you have somebody like Mike going for a walk with a patient. That's not a, he's not showing her how to walk. She knows how to walk. It's <laughs> relationship that, that I'm here to support you part that is the fundamental 
thing about what makes us human, what makes us people. We thrive on community. We need each other. The pandemic has been terrible for community because we've lost a lot of connections with people that we're used to seeing every day. And so it's important to be cognizant of the most important part of happiness is your relationships. And so that's why for us as a company, it's not throwing a bottle of pills over the fence to you. It's also about giving you a relationship, somebody that you can turn to. It is not gonna be your best friend, but it's somebody that you can turn to to try to get some advice from or that push when you're feeling down to elevate you up. That's the most important thing if we're gonna ever be successful at people's happiness and health. You know, it's funny, Colleen, you bring up the pandemic and we've almost gone through this entire, you know, discussion without bringing it up. And, and, I, and I, I'm so glad you did. Because <laughs> moderator. It's a, it, that's right. It's a good, it's because, yeah, it's exactly. Great moderator. Paul did yeah, that. Yeah, he, he, he kept it off, this. off the radar. But now let's bring it up. But I think about this and I, I say, I've said this to patients over the last, you know, several months. Let's go back two and a half years ago. Life was challenging then. And then came this pandemic. We don't know what's around the corner. And it goes to show you that, gosh, I, I think back, you know, two years ago, I mean, Paul, two years ago, you had not seen your first COVID patient in the ER yet. No, I, I, I remember the distinct moment. Right, so just two years ago. But think about how challenging and difficult and think about all the struggles people had two years ago. And then comes this pandemic. Talk about insult to injury. So, I mean, there, there are just not enough tools and there isn't enough preparation that we can do because we just never know what's coming. But I think, listen, you go into battle, you go with everything you have your chances of getting through that are significantly better no matter what it is you need to get through so uh it's just yet another tool in our tool shed but you just don't know what's coming yeah no i, I agree and and also being vulnerable enough to ask for help and and sort of say all right who who do i go to and they're going to give me good advice and they're going to be there for me uh, and you can lean on them so i think having that in place early so that you're not stuck looking for it, but it, it is amazing. There is chat groups, there's meetups, whatever is out there, there's groups anywhere you can find to find some support. Um, and so it, it's super critical to have that component in your life. Uh, yeah, now you being, I mean, that is just an understatement what that you just said. And when you look at the mental, the, the problems with mental health in this country, and it goes back to what we were talking about, right? address the mental health, create that trust in somebody, get that guidance. And going back to what we were talking about, right? That gut brain axis, you, people don't think about this, but when you adjust or get your mental health right, that signaling and Colleen, you know what I'm about to say, that signaling, when you have that stability, improving your stress, improving your management of, of your depression, improving anxiety, that signal that goes to your gut is a calming, a comforting, it's a, a better function. And what happens then? Well, all of these things that you're doing for your gut, your fuel, your, your fiber, all of these things that you're giving your body, well, now they start to work better. And when that starts to happen, guess what? It goes right back up to that central nervous system and it even further relaxes you, further improves all of these challenges that we have. So. It is understated and we can't say enough about this gut brain axis. And I think that, that that sort of, that dance that takes place is so critical. And I hope people go and look at this more and research and go to a reputable source because I, I think it's kind of new for a lot of people. And as you really explore it, it becomes just eye-opening. Yeah, I think one of the things you, you're talking about is there's a signal. There's a signal that happens that links the two components. And we know the whole body is linked by little tiny molecules that send signals to and from. And, and how do we actually create these molecules? And, and sometimes things like stress create cortisol that affects the gut, whatever it might be. Colleen's the expert in the room on this. Just to get down to the nitty gritty on some of this stuff, can you, Colleen, kind of just talk about just the specific strains that you have and how how that actually affects and why is it important? Because there's, there's these little tiny players and, and you kind of are this micro expert on, on sort of where things go biochemistry nothing gets more granular than in biochemistry hey mike what's the krebs cycle can you actually go over that right now <laughs> yeah right I, yeah if you had asked me 30 years ago after i crammed for the test i probably would have struggled 
Yeah. I love, I love, I love being described as a micro expert. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. So one of the strains that's in pendulum glucose control is called Acromancia mucinophila. And it, it's a mouthful there. So uh, we just call it Acromancia. And it's emerging as a major keystone strain in your microbiome. And what it does is it works on your gut lining. You know, we all have heard this kind of leaky gut, and it's really important that you have a good, good gut lining. Mm. This strain actually is responsible for that gut lining. So I think about it like, in my backyard, I have a wooden fence. And when we first moved into the house, this, the fence was, you know, shiny, new, all the planks were really strong and in place and kind of kept my backyard separated from my neighbor's backyard. Well, your gut lining is, is, a, is a fence like that. And, and what can happen over time through, you know, seasons and weather and sun and, and rain is that those planks can start to weaken and, and one might start to fall. And now all of a sudden you have this exposure to the outside world, your stuff that's on the inside is getting out and the outside stuff's coming in. And that's also what happens with your gut is that over time with aging and stress and all of the things that we do to our bodies, those that gut lining can start to have holes in it. And so acromancy is a strain that their job is basically to keep that fence strong. And so if you don't have enough acromancia, you have a weak fence. And so what's people been finding with like the emergence of microbiome testing and people really looking at what's in their guts is that if they're low in acromancia, they have a bunch of different disease states and metabolic syndrome is one of them, but it's such a key player. It's so fundamental to have a strong gut lining that if you don't have it, you have all kinds of things like inflammatory issues, you know, metabolic issues, and including even gut brain issues. And so one of the interesting things about acromancia is we talk about the gut brain connection is that it's a putative GABA producer. And so you, you literally, between the gut and the brain, there is an actual physical connection. It's called the vagus nerve. And that nerve literally connects your gut microbiome to your brain. And your gut actually makes a ton of neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters go right to your brain. And so this is a big part of the gut-brain axis. And one of the most fascinating things that is starting to emerge are these diseases that we have traditionally thought about as, as brain diseases. So Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. I started my career working in pharma. We were trying to develop drugs for Parkinson's disease and we obsessed over the brain. What are these plaques that are in the brain? How do we get rid of these plaques in the brain? What's going on here? All the targeting was around the brain. Well, it turns out you also have neurons in your gut. But unlike the neurons in your brain, the neurons in your gut, they can recycle. You get new ones. They regenerate all the time. And in fact, what they're finding is that before you can see these plaques in the neurons in your brain, you can see these plaques in the neurons in your gut. And so the new theory is that if you can get rid of the plaques in the gut, you're gonna stop it from making its way into the brain. It actually starts in the gut and then it's misfiring neurotransmitter in these small molecules that then make their way to the brain. And then you get these plaques in the brain and in your brain, because they don't turn over the, the, the neurons, you just kind of get stuck with these. And so it really, the gut brain axis is so important and it's such a new target that we've never explored before for all of these different disease states, including things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And I'm super excited about the opportunities there and really just understanding that all these systems are so intertied and the gut is really something we don't know anything about. It's an entirely new organ we've never explored before. Amazing, amazing stuff. And, and to know it, there's also a massive amount of our immune systems in our gut too. And so you talk about that fence protecting, you know, good neighbors, right? You know, the outside world is coming in through our gut and then we're sort of processing it, sterilizing it, creating nutrients, doing all that stuff. So on the other side of the fence, our body can have health. And so, you know, that makes total sense is that you want to have this fence to be totally healthy so that you're, you know, you have good neighbors on both sides of that fence. You know, you want some angry neighbor on the other side of the fence who's just, you know, fatty liver and you know, heart disease and all the different problems, the high blood pressure that comes with salty foods. And it's all just invading past this leaky gut. And, it, and it's, it's such a key concept. And I think we don't know enough about this. And this is what's critical to getting you guys together so we can advance this conversation on this leaky gut. I mean, it's amazing. It's not just, yeah, all, all the stuff that you said, you know, you don't want to have the angry neighbor, but also the role that the gut plays in the immune response, right? And, and I think that we are also just at the beginnings of understanding this, but your gut microbes can stimulate your immune response. And you'll start to see there are publications coming out now about, you know, how do we think about targeting the gut microbiome for battling infections such as COVID? And how do you really have a healthy immune system? It's not just about what's happening in your bloodstream, it's about what's happening in your gut and how that's signaling to your blood. 
Yeah, you touched upon a, a really important thing. And, you know, even with the time that we've spent, we didn't touch on it, which is the, the disease of dementia or even before we say dementia, just memory loss. And as we get older, yeah, we're not as sharp and, and we forget things. And, you know, when you look at all, it's, it's all inflammation, right? When you look at inflammatory disease, the word inflammation, in my opinion, just sounds like a bad word. It sounds to me, it's like the word Monday. Those words <laughs> strike fear in me, but inflammation sounds bad. And when you introduce inflammation to the brain, to the heart, the lungs, you see strokes, you see clotting, you see heart attacks, you see dementia, Parkinson's, all of these things. And in some people, you know, that's a big, big question when you look at dementia, especially, you know, what is causing early dementia? And, and, you know, maybe this person didn't smoke and maybe they lived a pretty healthy life. How are they developing these issues in their 60s i've seen it as young as late 50s what is going on i think when we look at our gut and we look at you know whether it's leaky gut and, and causing things like pre-diabetes or, or fatty liver or contributing to them i think we're going to find down the road that it's contributing to a lot of other things and i think that that sort of that big question that we have about a lot of things right when you you know is it, Doctors, you know, I, I was out last night with a few of my doctor friends and inevitably you start talking, you know how it is, Paul, you start talking about medicine, whether you want to or not. And whether you're discussing a case or whether you're discussing a, a, a phenomena or some sort of illness and you say to yourself, yeah, some things just don't make sense, but we're going to figure them out. And I think some of these things and the things that, that we're talking about today are insights into making sense out of some of these things that just don't make sense. So we're going to get there and we're just, you know, we're scratching the surface, but eventually I think a lot of these things that we don't get right now and we scratch our heads about, we're going to understand fully. Yeah. And I mean, just to add to the, you know, not understanding and scratching our heads, a lot of talk about food sensitivities, you know, this is a rising problem where people are sensitive to certain foods and the instinct is, oh, we'll start cutting back, you know, go to a very reductionist diet and then add one thing at a time when in fact, it could just be that your gut lining is not intact. And so if you simply had the right intact lining, you could now eat the foods that you used to be able to eat. And so I think, you know, rather than going at it from just one angle of, you know, minimizing things, really thinking about what's at the core of your gut and that gut lining and how do I make sure it's strong? That's going to be a super important part to, to things like food sensitivities too and allergies and things like that. Yeah, I think that's where you start calling. Absolutely. You know, build the foundation. And, and then, you know, I, I use a lot of journaling, a lot of insightful techniques with my patients that, uh, you know, writing down things, or I tell patients now, I've gone from writing down things to taking pictures of things. Um, because everybody has their camera and their phone, I, sh I should say. But I tell them, it, it, you know, other than the oxygen you breathe, if you put anything in your mouth, take a picture of it. It takes one second. And then reflect back and look at those pictures. They're all time stamped. They're all day stamped. You're going to know what you did and when you did it. But yeah, it, it's it's a tremendous point that, that you're bringing up and that a lot of these things, you know, for years, patients have said, I'm allergic to this. Oh, okay. What, what makes you say that? And then they proceed to tell you that they can't have certain foods that are in a certain category, yet they can only have 20% of them. I'm like, well, maybe it's not truly an allergy. Maybe you're just sensitive. So then comes the sensitivity discussion. And you're right. Let's create an environment that's conducive to handling some of these foods. You know, looking at foods, foods bring you joy. Foods are so associated culturally. There are so many things that revolve, that, you know, kind of revolve around sitting down and breaking bread with people. And it's a cultural thing. It's a friend thing. It's a celebration thing. So I'm not about giving up everything that's good. You made the point, and it's a very valid one, which is let's make a conducive, an, an environment that's conducive to handling everything. And then Let's introduce these things again and see if maybe these foods that we have once in a blue moon don't affect us as bad as they used to because now we have this gut biome, now we have this lining, now we have this, this thing that can allow us to not just tolerate these foods, but enjoy the joy that comes around that celebration. Absolutely. And, and one of the biggest times where people, I think, really lament not being able to eat is 
when they travel. And so I don't know if this ever happened to you, but I definitely know you go to certain places and you're like, oh man, I got to watch what I eat, but you really want to try the local food. And we had this interesting uh, story come through about a physician who, you know, loves to travel and would just bring like a suitcase of all these different things to like help him manage so he could eat the foods wherever he went to. Oh, wow. And, um, and then he went on uh, our Acromancia product, which is really just this gut lining strain. And he said he ran an experiment. He recently traveled and he only brought the Acromancia with him. He didn't bring the other stuff with him. <laughs> a like leap of faith. And he said it was amazing because he was able to eat all the foods he wanted to eat. And it was really what it showed him was it was really his gut lining. He just really had to make sure that that gut, that foundation was strong and he was able to, to eat all these right foods. So we are really just at the beginnings of learning, you know, how all these things are tied together. You just made an interesting point, Colleen, is that he took a long acromancia. And so that, that just to you know, put in context, that's the, the, a different product from the PGC. So maybe you can explain why you would make the choice for one or the other and how you came to developing two different products so that people do have this choice of how do you fit these products into making your gut healthier? Well, no, both don't necessarily apply to everyone. Pendulum glucose control is really for people who are looking to manage their, their glucose and the way their body responds to sugars. And so for that, if, if you're, you're worried about that and uh, you know, that's the product take now, I take pendulum glucose control. I don't have diabetes or prediabetes, but I know that as we age, we have a harder time metabolizing our sugars. And I know that I like to eat my sugars. And so um, I take that product because it's helping me to, and I actually wore a continuous glucose monitor, did the whole experiment on myself on, you know, what happened when I was, you know, on placebo versus on the pills. And so I could see that it actually helped me with my, my blood glucose. So that's what pendulum glucose control is for. Acromancia is really focused on your gut line. So if you're really thinking about your gut health and you're thinking about, you know, GI symptoms very specifically, that's, that's the product to go after. And so, you know, one is for managing your blood glucose, your glucose control, and the other is really centered around your gut lining. One thing to take note of is that acromancy is actually in pendulum glucose control. So if you are taking pendulum glucose control, it has acromancy in it because your gut lining is such a fundamental part of how your body manages all of its systems that it's in pendulum glucose control. And in fact, when we ran our clinical trial, if we didn't have acromancy in there, it didn't have as much efficacy on managing your A1C and your blood sugar spikes. So that's a sort of like fundamental core thing that, you know, we kind of have kept in, in that product and then just released it as its own strain. Oh, that's fascinating. The family of bacteria that you place into that probiotic has a different effect instead of just acromancy alone. But yeah, cool. pendulum, pendulum glucose control really has the ability to metabolize your fibers into butyrate, and that's a multi-step reaction. So it has all the uh, probiotics to be able to do that. And it has acromancy, which helps you with your, your gut lining. And it actually also has the prebiotics that feed those strains so that you have the whole comprehensive thing in one pill. And so that, that's really the, the totality of pendulum glucose control. And then acromancia is the gut lining strain that also has actually the prebiotics in it that help feed acromancia. Because I always say like, if you're going to drop me off on a deserted island, I'd rather also be dropped off with a cooler full of sandwiches and beers. And so <laughs> what we're doing is we're giving the sandwiches and beers to the strain and dropping them off together in your gut. Uh, Mike and I both have PVC. We're, you know, jumping on board. Maybe you could talk about where or what you, how do you, how would you get it? You can go to pendulumlife.com and you can purchase it directly off of our website. We do recommend that you talk to your physician about it. It's part of a comprehensive plan, but it is, you can purchase it off pendulumlife.com. And Mike, what other, you know, things are you, you sort of offering? Yeah, so a lot of the things that I've been doing uh, for the last 10 years is, you know, I still see patients every day. I go room to room. I, I'll never give that up. It's part of what got me where I am now. And it gives me really the fuel and, and a lot of the things that I talk about. But I have several groups. There's a large group uh, that you can get to. It's called DrMikeDiet.com. They're going to have everything in there as far as support systems. I run challenges. I have a, a robust team of very passionate people that we focus on introducing lifestyle change. We create 
private communities, private groups that allow people to bond and go through these journeys together. So we've been doing what we call 17 day challenges now for a few years. We run several of them throughout a year. Uh, you see me every day, I come on live, I talk to people, we talk about problems, struggles, uh, barriers. Uh, my support system is there 24 seven. More importantly, the support system that is created just organically when these people come together is there. Um, so drmikediet.com is where you can get everything. The books are always, of course, available on Amazon or every bookstore um, that you uh, want to do. There's an audio. And as you know, Paul, there's uh, uh, the e-version uh, and the good old hard copy. But uh, yeah, check it out. You know, it, there's a lot of great stuff in there. You know, I do these challenges quite often and we open them up to people all over the world. And what's cool about this is that, you know, you never know when you're going to need that that support system for you. But if something, you know, if trouble strike at two in the morning and you hop on, I will guarantee you, you will get a response from someone on the other side of the world who's just in this little group, this little challenge with you along for the journey. I mean, we'll oh, get wow. people from all from several countries all over the world every time we do these challenges, you name it. Um, so it's kind of fun because you meet new people and you meet people who are really in this for the same thing, which is getting healthy. And, uh, so it's a fun thing. So check it out. I I'm sure it's something, uh, that a lot of people can benefit from. And I love doing it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. And I think, you know, wrapping up here, I think we're about out of time. We'll have to sort of leave it here soon. But one of the things is, is that we talk about surrounding yourself with good people, support system, et cetera. I love that you create lists and meal plans so that you can surround, you know, create a, a refrigerator or a pantry so that you're surrounding yourself with good foods, good raw materials to start making the food and the, the, the recipes that you know are going to feed yourself well. And then Colin, you, you know, you're talking about, hey, what do you have in your refrigerator? Maybe you have a bottle of PGC that's, that's cold and, and it's ready there uh, for you or acromancy if you're worried about gut health. So I think it's crucial. You know, if you like you talk about if you make bad decisions and maybe your friends are making bad decisions and, and you're surrounding yourself with bad people, you have to almost remove yourself from that. You have to remove the junk food. You got to remove some of the things that are toxic to you. So I love that th these support systems you guys have in place, the platforms you've created are something you can jump into, just, just be in that ecosystem and you're going to start already making better decisions and you're already going to start seeing the benefits down the road in a really quick way. Absolutely. And then that's what we keep trying to do. And we're always tweaking things and doing new stuff, cooking demos, exercise classes, walking with me, virtual walks with me where, you know, we do all this stuff live typically, but yeah, it, it's about, you said it, Paul, you got to surround yourself with uh, that, that positive influence and you'll succeed. You'll get there. I want to thank, Colleen, for all that you've done, the platform you've created, PGC, also sharing all that you've learned over 10, 15 years and how it's actually going to benefit people, patients, and, and just all the work you've done. And, and Mike, thanks for being on the show. I know, you know, launching a book and uh, being in the middle of that, you know, launch and uh, PR and all that stuff has really uh, got your time squeezed. And so just jumping on here is real special for all of us here. And, uh, you know, best of luck with the book and the challenges and whatever you're you're endeavoring because we know it's going to be successful so thanks, thank buddy. you paul thank you so much and colleen thank you uh I, you know like i said we're all in this together right and we all kind of uh we we put our our two cents in but uh really appreciate you having me and taking the time to just uh you know do my part yeah thank you guys <laughs> thanks for pulling us together and for you guys taking time here and i think you know, people look to their doctors to help them understand how to navigate this world. And so having physicians like you two who are really helping people at a fundamental level in their health, their mental health, as well as their physical health, and pulling in all these different mechanisms to give them the support they need, it's huge. And I think, you know, Mike, you said it earlier, which is getting to have conversations with guys like you give me a lot of confidence and optimism for where it's all heading. We're really going to help so many people with the stuff that we're doing. So thank you guys for taking time to, to, to meet with me. Thank you. Appreciate it, Colleen.